Good evening. Uh, today is Tuesday, March 9th. Uh, we are here for the board meeting. Um, oh, no, let me start over. Sorry. The board meeting was called to order today at 5 p.m. Uh, with the board going into executive session under ORS 192.6602D to conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations. This executive session was announced in advance on Friday, March 5th both by listing it on the agenda and posting it online. Executive sessions are not open to the public. It is now 6 p.m. and we are reconvening our meeting with the public session, which is our regular, regular business meeting. And we're now gonna take board attendance. Director Blassie? Here. Director Lippold Pion? Present. Director Kylo? Here. Chair Chandra Geary? Yes, present, please. Director Hyen? Here. Director Goss? Here. And myself, Vice Chair Bethel. And just really quick, um, Director Chandra Geary is here, but he's zooming in from Alaska. And so just for connectivity reasons, I'm going to chair the meeting tonight just to make sure it runs smoothly. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Director Lippold Pion to do the gland acknowledgement. Thank you, Director Bethel. Um, so I'm just going to get into it. Acknowledgement is critical in building the necessary trust to coexist in harmony with one another. Indigenous tribes and bands have been apparent on the lands of the Willamette Valley across Oregon and throughout the Americas since time immemorial. In this valley, the ancestry of the Kalapuya reaches the furthest back in time, reminding us that this plentiful place has been called home by its original inhabitants long before the names of the snowy peaks and the bountiful waters were re-identified. Today, we acknowledge that the people of this land still exist and inhabit this valley, not as heirs to it or artifacts, but as reciprocal contributors to the modern society we live in. To we forward our respect to the first peoples of this land, the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon and those who have seceded lands here. We reflect on the displacement, removal and genocide of indigenous people that occurred throughout Oregon and beyond. In so doing, we truly honor the gravity of the past and endeavor to see that people may live in harmony and equity on this land for prosperity. Prosperity. May this acknowledgement carry renaissance as a tool of peace over the land and the waters we mutually rely on. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you. I, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Director Lippold Pion. We're gonna pull up the flag and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. It looks like we have no agenda modifications tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Superintendent Perry for spotlights. All right, good evening, Vice Chair uh, Bethel, Chair Chandra Geary, members of the boards, good to see you tonight. Uh, we have three spotlights tonight. And the first spotlight is gonna be presented by uh, Sylvia McDaniel, our Director of Community Relations and Communications uh, to present our Community Partner of the Month. Thank you, Superintendent Perry, Chair Chandra Geary, Vice Chair Bethel, members of the board. Tonight, we are uh, spotlighting uh, Monte Calvario uh, Brethren in Christ Church. We are incredibly grateful for the work they've been doing to help our community. A little less than a year ago, Monte Calvario began putting together food boxes for families with food insecurity in Salem Kaiser. Each Monday, they <coughs> put together 40 to 100 food boxes, which they give to a Salem Kaiser representative who then distributes them to families in need. Volunteers from the church pick up prepackaged food boxes from Birch Community Services each week. 
These boxes contain basic food items. However, the volunteers from Monte Calvario also add extra items that they have available, including more food. They began the program back near the beginning of the pandemic to see if it was worthwhile or something that they wanted to continue. They quickly saw that there was a clear need in the community and that it was beneficial to countless families in our district. So they continued the program weekly ever since. This isn't the only work Monte Calvario does for the Salem community. Bi-weekly, they cook food and take it to the arches to distribute to houseless individuals. In talking to them, they ask that we emphasize that they are not helping feed the community for the spotlight or for other praise. They don't mind being anonymous. Rather, they get satisfaction from simply helping people out of love. We are so grateful for the work they are doing to make our community a better place and look forward to our continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you to the group. All right, our next spotlight is going to be presented by one of our educators, uh, Lisa Cassidy. If you wanna turn on your screen, Hey, Lisa, how are you tonight? It's good to see I'm you. I'm well. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, good evening, Chair Tanaguri and board members. I'm excited to recognize the accomplishments of one of our McKay students today, Stacy Martinez Arroyo. Stacy is an 11th grader at McKay who recently was awarded a student grant from the Oregon Association for Talented and Gifted. Each year, OTAG awards three $150 grants to students in Oregon to augment and enrich their learning in a way that is personally meaningful. Stacy applied for the grant to pursue her learning of American Sign Language. Stacy is passionate about expanding her knowledge of ASL in the deaf community. Stacy uses her current knowledge of ASL to communicate with customers at work so that they know they are respected and included. In today's society, very few people who do not personally know a deaf person know ASL and Stacy wants to change that. She believes that it's important to provide communication tools to everyone and foster a community of acceptance and understanding. To that end, she's also working on starting an ASL club at McKay. Her desire to spread awareness and knowledge of ASL and deaf culture sets a positive example for us all, and we are very proud of her commitment to creating a community that includes all people. Her project truly exemplifies the spirit of McKay. Stacy, we look forward to watching your work progress, and we are very, very proud to call you a Royal Scott. Congratulations. Congratulations, Stacy. Thank you so much for the impact you're making in your McKay community. Really good to see you tonight. All right, our last spotlight is uh, will be presented by our assistant superintendent, Dr. Ethan Udosnata, and he's going to be presenting uh, our 2021 National Merit Scholarship finalists. Good evening, Chair Shonda Gary and board members. I'm pleased to highlight three Salem Kaiser High School students who have demonstrated academic excellence this year. Aaron Bakuli and Nathaniel Brown from South Salem High School and Carolyn, Carolyn Connolly from West Salem High School were all named National Merit finalists. This is a highly competitive program best based on PSAT scores. Out of 1.5 million test takers, 50,000 qualify for recognition in the National Merit Scholarship Program. Only 16,000 are named semifinalists. To reach the finalist standing that these three have achieved, they must then be recommended by their principals and or a designated school official. They must also display a record of academic success throughout their time in high school beyond test scores. The finalists standing, um, the finalist standing places, are, our, our current finalist places them in the top 0.01% of test takers across the US. It also means that they're now competitive for financial scholarships which about half of the finalists receive. These scholarships will be awarded based on a variety of factors, including academic performance, recommendations, essays, and more. Our three finalists will be notified by mid-June if they receive a scholarship. South's principal shared that she's excited about, about how Aaron and Nate both focused on their academic growth and how that resulted in their National Merit Scholarship, for, um, scholarship opportunity. Carolyn's counselor praised her work ethic, inquisitive personality, and kindness. 
all three students have taken a variety of challenging classes throughout high school during, um, including IB and AP. So we're really proud of these three outstanding students and we're so grateful that they represent the South, our Salem Kaiser schools. Um, it's obvious that they have a bright future and we're interested in uh, seeing how far they go. It looks like Principal Tiffin is here to say congratulations as well. Thanks for being here with them tonight, Principal Tiffin and Carolyn Nathaniel. And I, I don't think Aaron's on tonight, um, but congratulations to all three of you. Really um, fine academic achievement. All right, that's it for the uh, spotlights tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Perry. So we're gonna move on to public comment. And I'm sure that the community um, noticed that there was a slight change. So public comments, an opportunity for the board to hear from all of their constituents on agenda items. Uh, it's important that we hear from a broad spectrum of stakeholders so that we can make thoughtful decisions in the best interests of the school district. That was why you elected us. We received a large number of public comments through the written process. And due to the limited time we have to do board business, we have not given a fair opportunity to hear these many diverse voices. Tonight, our board meeting will focus on written comments and hear from those commenting on agenda and non-agenda items. And I wanna thank uh, Mrs. McDaniel for really highlighting this with us during agenda planning and in board leadership meetings last week. Um, we do receive a fair amount of email comments from the community and I think it's difficult for each board member to provide feedback um, all the time on all those specific topics. And uh, Mrs. McDaniel is quite inventive. So she created a process for that written comment to come in and then helped create a summary of those public comments. And I wanna share that with all of you tonight. And then this information will be posted on the website um, for the community as a whole to be able to view as well. So for tonight's meeting, March 8th, a total of 69 comments were received regarding the following topics. Resolution 202021-3, converting election of school board members to a by zone system, SRO reimagining discipline, school reopening, charter schools, emailing the board and public school violations. In regards to resolution 202021-3, a total of 58 comments were received, 34 were in support of the change, and 24 did not support this change. For the charter schools, two comments were provided. For SRO reimagining discipline, a total of 12 comments were provided. For school reopening, one comment. For emailing the board, one comment and for public school violations, one comment. And again, all of these will be posted to the school district website. And if, um, I don't know if it's Aaron or Ethan who's running the Zoom, but if we can see each other's faces, I would like for each board member to acknowledge that they did in fact receive public comment via email from Alice yesterday, um, just by a show of a thumbs up. I feel like I gotta chase you all over the screen. Um, Director Lippold Pion, perfect. Thank you everybody for acknowledging. Uh, um, for myself, um, I was able to go through the public comment last night and we did receive additional emails today. Um, all of our board members have made the commitment in advance to rereading the emails as we always have. But tonight, it's just, it's really critically important to us as a board for the community to understand that we are taking our time and we are reading those comments. So please continue to communicate to us through that fashion because um, for us it helps us process in advance of the meeting where the community is for particular things. Um, and oh, I don't know why I'm so nervous. I've run so many meetings before, but maybe it's because I can't actually see it, like talk to you people in person. Um, so that, it's a new process is we're going to conclude public comment now, which feels weird because usually we're spending an hour plus on that. Um, and we're gonna move into board reports, um, which I'm gonna hand over to Superintendent Perry. All right, and you're doing a great job. It's always uh, nerve wracking the first time around. All right, so our first uh, presentation is gonna be on Ready Schools Safe Learners. 
and the return to school update. And um, as um, per usual, we always have um, new news um, in the weeks between our reports, um, either at the state level or in the work we've done at the district. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sproles and Dr. Udosnata to provide the Ready School Safe Learners update and our return to in-person learning and lots of kids in our buildings this last week, which was really, um, really exciting. Um, I just wanna say, um, you know, when you think about five-year-olds and kindergarten students that haven't been to school yet and they're walking in in March, um, it's a little overwhelming that we've been out of school for um, almost a year and some of them haven't seen their classroom. So I got some great quotes. They're still kids, you know, but um, a little shocked at how big the library was really surprised that these were real people that they were meeting, worried about um, would they recognize their classmates because they'd only seen them on Zoom. So with that, uh, I think Dr. Sproul's your first up. Thank you, Superintendent Perry and Board Chair Chandra Geary and board members. And we do, as, as Superintendent Perry alluded to, we uh, always seem to come with new information because um, it's a flexible world out there and as we respond. But I think Tonight, we have a point of celebration about um, getting our kids back in school. And so the, the new information, um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you, uh, Dr. Udosin Atop. So um, probably all of us um, on the call um, heard that Governor Brown came out with a really direct statement last week, compelling all Oregon public schools um, to have kids return to school. She said the evidence has shown that kids can return to school and it's a very low risk of COVID-19 transmission. She said, we, if we follow our protocols and, and if we adhere to the Ready School Safe Learners guidelines, um, the evidence has shown across the state of Oregon that we can have kids back in person education and do it safely for um, not only for our students and our teachers, but our community as well. So this is, um, it's not groundbreaking for those of us who have been uh, following this research for the last several months, but it was a very bold statement, um, compelling people to come back, uh, come back in person. We, we were a little bit ahead of that trajectory. And so, as you all know, we started with kindergarten and first grade um, about nine days ago. And then we started with second and third grade today was actually half of our second and third graders first day back in Salem Kaiser Public Schools. Um, so we're meeting the, the guidelines that the governor set forth. And we just have some pictures here. And I think pictures can really tell the picture of, um, tell the story of what life last week was. And it was a lot of excitement. So as you all know, and, and each picture I'll just comment on really briefly, um, this is bringing kids back to school of all, uh, involves a lot more operations than just opening the door. And we've had such strong support from our transportation team, from our bus drivers, from our crosswalk attendants, from all across the operational staff to be able to provide safe, sanitized buses for our students. And so, and it all worked on Tuesday, the buses started rolling up with groups of kids. Now, of course, the groups are smaller than normal. We don't have as many kids on each bus, um, but our buses are running. So in the next slide, you can see uh, we had people out in front. Many of us participated in this first day. Honestly, it was more about us um, than about the kids because we were so excited um, to see people. Um, I was at Richmond and Chavez, Swigel, and it was so exciting to see people coming back to school and getting back in the routine. Um, we had lots and lots of new backpacks, as you can imagine, lots and lots of new um, facial coverings as well, which was kind of a unique new back to school feature um, that I hadn't thought about. Um, we, we actually had, this is uh, Kennedy, they had the red carpet treatment for their uh, kinders and first graders coming in to show them what a group of uh, strong superstars they are and what a group of strong superstars they're becoming um, as we get them in the door. And then we just got down to school and that was the amazing thing. Like a half an hour in, you walk into the classroom and it was like, oh, um, this is school. There's a teacher there and he or she is teaching and delivering content to a group of kids who are learning and interacting together. Um, they took recess throughout the day. They had uh, mind and body breaks. They used technology um, as well. This is a good picture that shows kind of the 
physical distancing and the spacing that we have in our classrooms. Normally our kids would be clustered much, much closer together. The other thing I think the board um, can acknowledge is when in each of the elementary classrooms, things like rugs, you know how we've always sat crisscross applesauce on a rug and brought kids together and sit knee to knee and ear to ear and do some whisper reading. Um, all of that um, right now isn't what we can do. So we needed to explore new ways of teaching and learning, which our teachers are doing every single day. Moving students through the building is something that is a highly orchestrated action, um, a lot different than just line up at the door um, for recess when we blow the whistle like in days of old. Um, we are physically distanced as we move through the building. And again, um, the students, and we all know this, it's really a lot around the adults more than it is around the students, honestly. Once the students understand the physical distancing and understand mask wearing, they're, they're very, um, they're very um, strong supporters of it, actually. And if you break that rule, um, they will call you out. So even a five-year-old understands physical distancing much, much more uh, stringently at times than adults do. So this is just an example of kids are still moving, kids are still dancing, there's still go noodles going on in classrooms, um, lots, of, lots of laughter, lots of physical uh, enjoyment. And for our teachers, um, it's lots of contact with kids who some of whom they've only met online, which is a really profound, if you can think about spending as much time um, with a group of kids as our teachers have for the last six months and as much love and energy and attention they've poured into these kids, um, never having met them. So that's a big emotional day um, for our system and for our, um, for our families as well. So it was over um, more quickly than it normally is. And remember, we just have a five hour instructional day now, um, which goes um, pretty quickly um, for students. We were worried about what are these groups of kids who have never sat through classrooms? How are they gonna um, do? And they did really, really well last week, particularly our youngest, our kinder and first grade students. And then the day was over and they rushed out and gave their parents a hug, just like they always do. Um, parents lined up. We had to move the parents away a little bit more than the kids because they were physically distancing, waiting for the kids to come out the door. Um, so we had to have them stand on the dots on the sidewalk as well. So um, it was overall very successful last week. And here are some lessons that we've learned um, from week one. Overall, um, lots of excitement um, to have our students back. We are thrilled to be able to see their faces. We're thrilled to be able to establish relationships. Everyone on this call, every single teacher in our system understands that learning happens best in a deep relationship between a teacher and a student in the presence of content. We know that. And so these relationships, these in-person relationships that have been fostered online for several months are now, um, they're actually seeing people, which is exciting. Um, we still have many, many, many logistics that are being worked out. And I want to applaud our, our district operational staff, our elementary principals um, who have lost many hours of sleep thinking about how am I going to line up kids for the bathroom and how am I going to get them to the cafeteria and how are they going to walk out to recess and get back from recess safely? Um, how are we going to follow, you know, I think it's 87 pages now of the Ready School Safe Learner Guidelines. Um, that's a lot of logistics that all come down to the moment of, and then we're going to teach reading and math. So I don't think we can underplay how, um, how much work this has been for our teachers and our principals and how well they've risen to this challenge. Um, it's also important to realize we've been preparing for this moment for many, many months and it's paid off. Um, we were one of the first, we were the first large district to offer kids in-person instruction. It's going to mean our kids get five to six weeks more of in-person than a lot of the other districts and even more than, than some of the districts that are um, struggling to bring kids back. And so I think that makes a difference. And I think that um, speaks to our board's focus on this and all of the time we met with our, with our school board and they encouraged us to keep a, a high level of preparedness. And so I think that makes a difference. It also makes a difference our relationship with our local public health authorities Marion and Polk County. So I applaud them as well because they helped us get to this point. And then finally, we just need to keep following our procedures and protocols. And we all know that. We know the three big things that prevent the spread. It's still hand washing, it's still physical distancing, and it's still facial coverings, just like it was last month, 
just like it'll be next month. Even with vaccinations, we still will follow our protocols as they come. So overall, big sigh of relief <laughs> for our organization. We took a collective sigh as we start getting kids back in and welcoming kids and families. Um, and then we have some announcements about secondary as well from Dr. Idosa Nata. And some people are very excited about this part of the presentation. Good evening, uh, Chair Chandra Gary, Vice Chair of Bethel and members of the board. We are really excited um, about bringing students back to secondary, so middle school, high school. Uh, it was really encouraging uh, for um, our secondary leaders and teachers to see um, the amount of success that we had bringing back our elementary uh, students. And it, um, it, gave us, uh, it gave us a little leg up when it comes to planning. And so now I think that we have a higher level of confidence that we're gonna be able to bring students back smoothly. Um, so I have some updates to give you and really um, the updates that I have to give you, they aren't a big um, deviation from what we shared a couple of weeks ago, but I think what it does is it brings back some certainty about some of the planning that's happened. And I, and I just wanna say, give a kudos to, to our secondary team for um, the amount of planning that they've done. They really hit the ground running. And our uh, secondary leadership is really uh, working hard to make sure that the buildings will be ready when students return in April. So in terms of our secondary model, uh, last time we shared that we had two possible models. One of them was the, uh, was the model which is in front of you right now, which is what we um, call the, the hybrid model. And the other was a, an applied learning day, just in case we didn't have the capacity to serve students in the hybrid model. So after doing a detailed classroom analysis, we're pleased to share that we do have, um, we do have the capacity to serve our students in a in hybrid model, which is really encouraging. What that means is that students will come to school for two synchronous days of in-person learning. Um, there'll be a Tuesday, Thursday cohort and a Wednesday, Friday cohort. And then they'll do two days of applied learning. Now, what we're hoping will happen with this applied learning is that it will be ramped up a little bit more so whereas a, a student may have spent some time working independently, um, doing some read class readings, or maybe even seeing some videos um, during their synchronous days so that the teacher can monitor and make sure they're engaged. We're hoping that um, students will be able to do some of that work on their applied days as well um, so that students could really uh, roll up their sleeves and engage with their, their uh, classmates and their teachers during the, the synchronous learning days. Um, so uh, Mondays will still be dedicated to uh, student support days in Care and Connect. It's an opportunity for staff to collaborate, to do some planning, and also to reach out to students and provide supports for students that don't, uh, that maybe may not be engaging. Um, I know there's some questions about whether a family um, has an option to stay remote or go CDL or, or, or stay in the remote learning or go into in-person learning. And so um, we, we do have an op options for families. Um, as you recall, and we had a, uh, an all call or a last chance to sign up for, for EDGE in December. And really what we're trying to do is get as many families as we could to sign up so that when this day came that we would reopen, um, we wouldn't have to adjust too much because it's really challenging to shift uh, staffing back and forth with so much complexity. So we do have some limited space or families if their circumstances have changed and they must stay in CDL. Although our, our capacity for, for edge right now is limited. If you're a high school student and let's say that maybe you have one class that you, uh, one or two classes that you need to take, well then you have an additional option which is uh, SKO, Salem Kaiser Online Academy where students could um, take a, a class independently online. And so there's a couple of options for families should they choose to stay in remote learning. So let's talk about some of our transition dates. Uh, so for quarter three and quarter four, all of our staff are coming back on, on the April 5th. And that's a day where they get to re-engage with their buildings if they haven't been around for a while, um, learn uh, about the protocols and safety protocols that they'll need to get used to or um, uh, learn more about as we prepare to bring students back in the, in the week after that. Um, that also coincides with the end of the quarter, so quarter three will be ending. So the eighth, which is a Thursday, will be a grading day. The ninth will be our official transition day for staff to, to be on site and get their rooms ready and prepare to bring students back on the 13th. Um, Monday will continue to be our student support day, as you see there. 
And just to give you a little bit more detail of when students will return, um, for the high school level, uh, we're, we're doing something called a smooth start. It's the same scaffolded rolled out that we did for our, our elementary uh, last week. So we wanna give our younger students um, at each level an opportunity to be in the building and not be overwhelmed by the volume of students who might be in attendance. Um, so our ninth and 10th graders, remember our ninth graders have not been on the school campus yet. They'll get an opportunity to be on the campus for a day and get acclimated and, and get some orientation. Um, and our 10th graders will as well on April uh, 13th if they're in the Tuesday cohort or 14th if they're on the Wednesday cohort. Um, and then we'll bring um, 11th and 12th back on the 15th, 16th. Uh, for our middle school, we'll bring back our sixth grade students. Um, same, they'll get a day by themselves on campus, the first day to be on campus on April 13th. And um, our uh, 7th and 8th will then join them on the 15th and 16th. And just to eliminate any confusion, um, right here on the very top, uh, our 9th and 10th graders, they'll also come to school on the 15th and 16th as well. So just for those of you who are visual learners, here is an example of what uh, our middle school schedule would look like. This is something, uh, this is very similar to what they're already doing, um, but they'll come to school. Uh, if you're, this is for our Tuesday cohort, they'll come to school first period, second period, third period. Uh, they'll get a lunch and then fourth and fifth, and then they'd have their applied learning day and then repeat Thursday and Friday. Um, it's very similar for the high school. You'll see that um, this is for the uh, Wednesday, Friday model. Um, they go first and second period, have a break, and then come back third and fourth period. Um, we will be determining uh, how we're going to fit in that advisory period, and we hope to be able to release the bell schedule by the end of the week. And so that brings us to the next slide, which is looking forward. So again, we want to have bell schedules by the end of the week. Um, so also, we uh, are going to hold some district-wide family information sessions. And Director McDaniel is going to share more details about those events that are happening the weeks of March 16th through 19th, and again on March 31st. And what that will do is it'll set up families to ask um, school-specific questions uh, at school events led by their principals on the week of April 5th. So, uh, Director McDaniel, do you want to walk people through this um, this last slide right here about all the events that are going on and, with, and what families can expect? Like we did with our elementary uh, hybrid reentry, we're doing the same with secondary. And I wanted to preface this by saying um, this was a team effort to organize this. Um, I really want to say uh, kudos to uh, Cheryl Bennett's team, um, her um, interpreters and translators for being a part of this whole effort for us. And also for Sandy Price and her CSOCs for helping to get the information out. Um, you know, and connecting with families and also Cynthia Richardson's uh, group of equity um, team and also the communications team, particularly Jacqueline Benavides, who is our uh, community engagement specialist, who just really just went through and got these um, 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 sessions organized very quickly and with really, really great um, um, reception from all the folks that she's connected with. So this is what it looks like for all of us. Um, for starting off next week, actually, uh, the 16th, we'll be starting with um, the English language session. And I just wanted to stress that all families are welcome at this session. Um, the uh, remaining week, we have interpreters available for Arabic, Spanish, Russian, uh, Swahili. You'll notice that Chukis and Marshallese will be after spring break on March 31st. And then for parent support groups or, or, or groups that um, want um, uh, to ask questions um, related to their own experiences with Salem Kaiser. We have the African American um, Black families or those uh, parents who have biracial uh, youth or uh, kids of African descent or African American youth. And um, as you know, in elementary, uh, during the elementary reentry, we did an outing um, on Sunday with the churches. We've uh, already done that. So we decided to do this particular one on Zoom and have people organizing this for us. Then of course, the American Indian and Alaskan Native. So again, all of these have been very, very receptive with all of our families. They really, really appreciate when we connect with them specifically. So they have questions 
um, uh, that we can answer specific to their own needs. Thank you, Director McDaniel. So just to, to wrap up our, our, um, our preparation for bringing students back on uh, April 13th, uh, I just want um, the, the board and the public to know that uh, our, our um, building leaders have just done a really good job of, of making the adjustments in their classrooms so that there's uh, spaces uh, for that honor the, the 35 square foot rule as set forth by the um, Ready School Safe Learners um, guidance. So most of our classrooms should be somewhere between 13 and up to 20 students. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are, are giving students space. It'll look similar to the elementary. And uh, I also wanna um, give credit to our facilities group uh, led by Dave Hughes, who is working with each uh, building individually to make sure that they're um, working through pinch points to, to create as much space as we can for students. And um, so we really, uh, hopefully the next time when we present uh, on this, we'll be able to share more progress that has been made. And then um, we are really looking forward to bring, bringing our secondary students back on, in April. So let me give you an update real quick on the OSAA um, in athletics. So um, last time we reported that we would uh, be starting outdoor contact sports on February 22nd. Uh, last week, we had our first full week of competitions. Uh, I believe we started with soccer on Monday, the, uh, March 1st, and then we have uh, we ended the week with football uh, that uh, occurred on Friday and again on Saturday. So um, it was nice to give kids that opportunity to have the opportunity to uh, compete. Um, there's no spectators at this point, and that's due to um, a county high risk status. And I know that for those who uh, look forward to cheering on our students and their, their kiddos on the, the field of play, that that's um, disappointing. But what we have done is established a, a streaming service for uh, on field activities. So I think that really applies to our soccer and our football. And then um, when volleyball begins and if and when we have basketball on the court, we'll be able to stream um, have a streaming service for that as well that uh, families can access. Um, also, we have good news that the district has opted into cheer. I know some are wondering uh, what the status of cheer was. I uh, do know that cheer is a full contact uh, activity. Um, therefore, it falls under the same protocols as other full contact activities like football. Um, the practices are underway. I know some may be interested. And so um, the practices have started for north, uh, south, Sprague and West. And at this point, McKay and McNary are not practicing. Um, we will update you all if uh, they begin, um, if they begin to um, practice cheer. So um, also good news is that uh, music competitions will begin. Um, just a little bit of detail on when uh, music, uh, what will be happening with music. Uh, there'll be OSAA culminating performances uh, and the, the guidance is underway for how we'll, we'll practice, but practices will start um, after school very soon. And uh, in May 24th through 29th, there should be culminating performances and competitions for band, orchestra, choir. And there should also be solo performances and uh, culminating activities for, uh, on May 3rd through 7th. So again, uh, we've been waiting for a while to get guidance on, on music and we just got that news today. So. Uh, again, it's just another uh, another thing to be excited about is we're continuing to see more opportunities for kids and, and, and more ways for them to be engaged. And I think that next we have Reimagining School Discipline and Safety Well-Being Summit updates from our superintendent. Yeah, I don't know if we have questions first. Oh, yeah. What about yeah, some questions? Yeah. You tried to whip right by can the question. Ah. <laughs> can we go back to the all view of the board, please? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay, are there questions from the board? Really? <laughs> I like it might be a first. Okay, yay, we're, they're coming in slow. Uh, Chair Chandra Geary. Well, thank you very much for bringing our kids back to school. Uh, so there, there are two important questions kind of tie in. One is about the learning loss and and how much they have to catch up. Uh, 
especially as those kids are transitioning out of high school into college and will there be you know so that is one piece of question are we in a position to offer either all year or a fifth year of high school for to catch up for the learning loss the second piece is what provisions are we making to address the serious mental health consequences you know depression suicide risk of these students who are struggling and uh, for a variety of reasons we have discussed before now they come to school two days a week but how are we going to ensure that they don't fall between the crack on the other days when they are struggling with suicidal thoughts and mental health thank you well, vice chair better yeah let me answer a couple of those um because i think we did um talk about this last time in the boardroom as well um that we're preparing for a number a number of summer school options and that we also are um really wanting to meet kids where they are and um as uh we think about their mental health we don't want to think about it immediately as learning loss and have this be a deficit model when they come in um right now we're focusing on care and connection with them so we can really assess uh, mental health um some news i got uh today in a meeting was there will be some additional dollars for summer school activities as well and they're also really promoting those dollars to go to some of our um our community partners who might be interested in doing summer learning opportunities with a focus on play and um connection because we know what that's what they need as well and just as a reminder to Dr. Uh, Chandra Giri we kids always have the option to come back as a fifth year we want them to be done in four years because we want them to launch into what's next but we take a lot of kids in a fifth year often um so we'll be doing summer school credit recovery trying to get them to be 2021 graduates as many as we can and then any any senior that hasn't graduated always has the opportunity to come back and finish um as far as the mental health um supports um i think we've also highlighted these multiple times in the boardroom and um we have our um a private partnerships at almost every school we've added social workers we've added counselors our counselors have had hotlines going throughout um we uh, i think won't know all of what to expect until we get our kids here um and the most important step i think has been to get them back um i know um as we see them back in person i think that helps a lot and we can really have their eyes on them um to help understand what they're experiencing I don't know if it will be enough. We will monitor um and watch um as we go. Um and really mental health is primary for us. We can catch them up. And we have to think of this as a 12 year journey, not a um, you know, covid is a year. So, um we're going to meet with them where they at are at and um be ready for what they need. Thank you. Uh, Director Kylo Yeah, before Superintendent Perry says we you've answered this before. I'm still curious as to what happens on the odd days. Who's answering the students' questions and working with them? If I'm a Tuesday, Thursday, who's answering my questions and helping me on Wednesday, Friday? And what are the te what teacher is that? Since the teacher is teaching on Wednesday, Friday. So I'm yeah. still not clear on how that schedule is working yeah. and who's actually doing the help on those the other days. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. we Well, you go ahead Ethan. Yeah, well, there's that's a um that's a good question and so just here's a here's two approaches. Uh one is that uh our teachers are sending our students off of work that they that they um and they give them instructions on. Mm -hmm. And so but there are office hours scheduled in the day. Remember our day and you haven't seen the bell schedule but our day is going to be shorter. Right. Um, than it currently is and so there's going to be more access to office hours on those days but, but, I, have, but I have two days worth of students trying to reach me during my office hours yeah. every day mm -hmm. i mean are you going to expand my teaching day so that i can meet all of those hours are you going to make me take the work home and and do well, it, it, from it, home how are you i don't i can't see how you're going to get sure. the numbers in in your office hour time the the demand for office hours at this point um well, is it every to... single student reaching out to the to the um teachers and normally they're really quick questions that could be answered quickly 
And so there's, there's that, but also um, teachers are getting an additional hour and it's, it's um, teacher directed prep, but it's also an opportunity for students to engage, uh, to ask questions. And I know that teachers really do um, um, spend time getting back to their students quickly. And then so we're, also not- gonna con- we're also gonna continue to use Canvas and Canvas is a tool that students can use to engage with, with their teachers asynchronously as well. And so those are just three ways that if I'm, a te- if I'm a student and I'm stuck and I need to get a question answer or additional guidance that I can reach out to a, a teacher. So, so if I'm a teacher, however, from the other perspective, I'm dealing with two sets of students at the same time. I'm dealing with the Tuesday, Wednesday students on Wednesday. I mean, everybody at the same time. If I, if I mean, so my, where's my attention at? The, the expectation is to interact with both students at the same time during it instruction time. It is not or time. it is? It is not. It, okay. the, the expectation is that teachers who have the same course load as they normally would do would engage in, with students during those office hour times that are available, which is a couple of hours a day. That, that sounds like pie in the sky, but okay. I might be able to answer that from an elementary perspective as well, Director Kylo, because it's slightly different um, at the elementary. Um, So at the at the elementary level, it's the same A day B day schedule. So it's a Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Friday. And on the day when the students are learning at home, um, they're having contact with their off schedule specialist teacher. So they'll have a PE schedule, they'll have a music schedule. A lot of them are also having a time with the media assistant. And then they're, the teachers are planning for asynchronous activities for them to complete while they're at home. Right. And um, similar to the secondary model, the teachers do have an additional hour every day to be able to support those students at home um, at the end of their work day. So, so they won't be delivering instruction at that time, but they will be providing supports if families need it. See, that was the answer that you gave me when I asked about the elementary days, and I appreciated that, but I'm not hearing that, and I don't understand how that would work mm-hmm. at the secondary yeah. level because they don't have the same specialists, they don't have the same needs, they don't have the same classes. That's where I'm having the disconnect. Okay. Okay. And so, and so it's, I'll just reiterate one more time and then I'll let uh, uh, Superintendent Perry provide a response. So that I know of, and we're in close communication with the association, um, we haven't heard that there is a shortage in being able to address some of the questions that are asked during those office hour times. And remember, office hours are being extended and teachers are sending students away with work that they gave them direction on um, in advance. And so we're confident that we're going to be able to meet the needs. But if not, we'll take feedback and find other ways that we can support the needs. And the expectation is not that we were asking um, teachers to instruct while fielding questions um, on email or during office hours. So I just want to be really clear on that because I think that was part of your question. I see um, Director uh, Mibinton is asking a question and then- Yeah, uh, so just a minute. Uh, So Kathy, um, Director Goss had raised her hand earlier. Do you still have a question? You're on mute. You can shake your head if no. (laughs) Okay, so uh, Ms. Mibinton. And before you ask your question, I want to acknowledge that I did not call you into role and I apologize for that because I do see that you're here (laughs) and you're on mute. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Um, My comment was um, um, with Eton, just to explain, as a high school student, I would see how we would do it in person too, because um, see, I have school Wednesday, Friday. So that means on my off days, um, they're dealing with their, um, you know, Tuesday, Thursday students. And I can email a teacher during their office hours or on Monday on the connection days. And usually they get back to you on your off days 
or uh, they'll tell you when you come into school on Wednesday, Friday, you could get help too. So I would, it seems to work that way. So I'm guessing that's what Eton is trying to explain that they are available on the days they're dealing with their other students too during their extra time that they have. Thank you. Director Lippold Pion. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. My first is directed towards uh, uh, Ms. Mabinton, uh, well, advisor Mabinton. I want to make sure to get the title in there. Um, but my question to you is, uh, thank you. Well, first, thank you for explaining that. But my second question um, to that is, uh, as a student, have you found that those office hours are sufficient enough for you to be able to get your questions answered in a timely manner? in a timely manner? Like for example, if you have homework done on like Wednesday or Friday, are you able to get a hold of your teachers or somebody on Tuesday or Thursday in enough time to where you can get your work done uh, and have your questions answered so that way it's done by the time Wednesday rule comes along? Um, 100% yes. Um, even just really fast, like emailing them, um, I think maybe they keep their email notifications on. So during class, they're probably not um, you know, talking the whole time. Um, it's, I know I have art and sometimes we sit and we have quite a bit of work in our assignment. So teachers, especially like that, they are sending emails usually while after they're teaching or even during their office hours, I, I type there like this. So I would say they respond pretty quick and that's been all of my quarters of school so far. Are there any further questions? Director Shantagiri. I'm still kind of going back to the question of the mental health surge. You know, I just want to ask, in the beginning we were under, you know, there is a, what is that, the multi-tiered approach was one of the way we were trying to deal with social emotional pain. I, based on what I can understand, there is a good possibility that we'll have a tier three need more than what we are used to. Perhaps tier two need will be more than what we are used to. I'm not saying that we should have a deficit model, but I'm only trying to ask, how can we be realistic and take care of that extra surge or demand beyond what we have already factored in? Are we putting in place extra referral model opportunities where people can be referred because I know Trillium is one of the contract, but they're not able, I don't believe that the old uh, caseload or number of fo folks we were referring in tier three will be able to take care of the surge. In 2018, we lost 20 youths to suicide in Marion County and our school district lost several. And so I'm really kind of going back to that question of what steps are we taking before we, before, while the kids are coming back to put in place so that we don't lose anybody, uh, God forbid, to suicide or any negative outcome uh, way before we are in a crisis mode to take care of the tier three and tier two? Uh, so first of all, I, I was only referring to deficit model with our academics because I really want us to be able to prioritize care and connection first. And then um, Craig, would, you look like you had a couple additional responses um, to that because all our um, MTSS and our suicide risk assessment processes are still in place. But did you want to add something to that, uh, Dr. Sproles? Just a couple of things, uh, Dr. Chandra Giri, I, I think you're hitting on something which we take really seriously mm -hmm. and which we've been hearing from our teaching staff and also from the new social workers that we've hired and the counselors that we've hired. So remember throughout this year, we've been gearing up for this moment in time um, by adding new clustered social workers to work with families who are struggling to get them reconnected. We've added um, cultural resource specialists, we've added CSOCs and we've added school counselors. Um, all, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned our MTSS support models because all of those are different webs of support. 
Um, but we're also asking our school teams to really focus on care and connection now in the referral process, exactly like you mentioned. Normally this time of year, we'd be focusing on academic data because we would be talking about our kids ready for the next, you know, to transition to the next grade level. So our teams right now are focusing on exactly what you're suggesting, which is how are, how are our students doing social emotional and what are interventions we can put in place before they reach that tier three um, threshold. What we're hearing right now is that we have capacity to meet the needs of the students right now, um, but, but we are adding more and more every week. And so, um, and part of it is our relationship with Stronger Oregon and with Trillium and Marion and Polk Mental Health. You know, we have our, our therapists, but they don't, they're not, um, they're more ongoing therapists than they are responsive to emergent needs. So we're balancing both of those things right now. Is there a way to communicate with families where they can find, because even the families are kind of struggling knowing where to go, where are the referral sources, who yes. takes private insurance, who take publicly funded insurance or no insurance. Because when we had a spate of students, we went from school to school and did some program. And after that, of course, we had a year long break. Even our badges started having numbers. But in this new reality, what outreach are we putting in place? Would you please highlight so that uh, families also know this information that you are having? And if it would please the board, I could bring those back. We're actually developing that resource um, just this week. About 20 minutes ago, I saw the, the template that we are developing on how to outline what those resources look like for families, not only for socio-emotional supports, it's also for academic and community supports. Um, but we are in the process of creating that. I could bring that back if it, um, if it would be helpful um, to kind of outline, because it's a pretty long list um, as a resource. Just as a referral, if anyone is listening to this, to us right now, um, on our website, there is a counselor referral hotline on, our, on the Salem Kaiser website that people can go in right now if they're ex experiencing an emotional um, or mental health crisis and need support. We do have the helpline and it's still being monitored um, in the immediate, but, but I can bring back those resources if the board would like. Thank you, it looks like we would like that. Okay. Uh, Director Lippold Pion, do you have one last question on this topic? Uh, yeah, I do. So, um, give me one second, I wanna go back to it. Okay, so this was on the OSAA updates in regards to like sports and extracurricular activities. Um, as a parent of a child who goes to Salem Kaiser, I feel like I'm either, uh, I feel like if I wasn't a part of the board, I would, know, I would have no idea what's going on with uh, sports or extracurriculars or anything like that. I might just be the worst parent ever uh, with complete possibility. But I think uh, something that, a question I had in regards to that was, what are we doing to ensure that parents and students know that sp what sports or extracurriculars are available and when and how to access it and that sort of stuff just because I feel like I haven't really heard much. Um, and so I was just wondering what we're doing to ensure that people know what's going on. Ethan? So um, just starting this, uh, this fall, our principal started sending out a weekly update to all families. And within that weekly update, uh, there's, there's uh, reference to athletics and activities starting. And also on the school website, there's uh, most school websites have a, a link to athletics that are available. And then once they actually get engaged with a certain um, activity, for instance, cross country, um, students will get, or uh, families get notification on the Remind app. And so I'm a parent of a, a cross country um, athlete and I get a Remind app update on everything from one competition start to where practice is gonna be probably um, three or four times a week. So that's normally how you know we notify families. However, um, if, if you're um, hearing that we need to do a little bit more to ensure that, that um, families aren't missing out on opportunities to get engaged, we'll, we'll huddle up with our district athletic directors and our other athletic directors and make sure that we're doing more to promote our athletics because we certainly don't want anyone to feel left out. Advisor Mabinton, did you have something else? Your hand is still raised. Okay. Um, and then I just, as a parent uh, as well, want to say to Director Lippold Pion, sometimes getting into those notification streams is a bit challenging, but once you're in, you can't turn it off. 
<laughs> and True. you're lucky enough to be a McNary parent. Um, those weekly updates do come every week and they do an excellent job of informing us. But I would like to give a suggestion to the district that at the middle school level, um, it's less than awesome. And I had to chase fast and hard to try to figure out how to plug in my middle schooler. And I looked all the places and eventually did find it, but I was behind the eight ball because I wasn't getting notifications and I'm a few years into the system. So for those younger age ranges, like maybe a little more effort to parents would be excellent because some of the high school age kids are chasing parents down to get them into family ID um, to, to go about accessing. So with that topic complete, uh, Superintendent Perry, we're going to move on to Reimagining School Discipline, Safety, and Wellbeing Summit. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Again, I have two guests with me tonight from uh, the Metropolitan Center at New York University. And um, I just want to kind of do a lead in um, to this topic, and then they're going to take it from there. Uh, they have been working in our district um, since about the middle of January, as we work to bring an external external uh, facilitator in uh, to help us out. Um, when they're completed with this, uh, their part of the presentation, I also um, had some reflections on restorative processes today, so I might uh, bring that in. Um, but I did have a statement I just wanted to read tonight, so I was sure that I got my words right. Uh, so before I begin, I want to acknowledge that the decision about the role of law enforcement in our schools and the ongoing discussions about safety have taken longer. Um, I feel like um, they've taken too long for you as the board, they've taken too long for us, and they've probably taken too long for our community. Uh, sometimes uh, the hardest of things are harder to unwrap and figure out than when you first started. So it's been year, a yearly, a, nearly a year of dialogue with our Salem-Kaiser community and um, multiple, um, many, many, many conversations about this. So while the process has taken longer than I would have wanted, this has given us the opportunity to have conversations with students, families, educators, including our st school leaders, community members. And in all these conversations, people have repeatedly, we have the same goal. Um, they've expressed a desire to have our schools that all school students feel welcome, have a sense of belonging, have physical safety and security. And I um, do truly believe it's within our collective power to create a school community that ensures physical and emotional safety. And it feels like those have been the two competing uh, things. Um, so for some people, school safety is intertwined with the school resource officers. The SRO model was originally created following a national model that is predicated on the ability to develop strong relationships between officers and students that are forged with daily contact across a variety of settings. However, over time, the role of the SRO in the school district has experienced mission drift and the results and resulted in an SRO program that does not follow the national model of SROs. Not anyone's fault. Um, many of our agencies are underfunded and um, mission drift has happened. Um, but due to the expanded role and responsibilities of the SROs, officers have been spread too thin to actually create um, strong relationships with many, many of our students. Um, so we've also heard from many of our students and parents of color that the presence of armed police officers in schools can result in emotional and physical harm that makes them feel unsafe in our schools. Many of these students have told us time and time again, you've heard it, I've heard it, um, that the just the presence of law enforcement negatively impacts their mental health and is a barrier to them developing a strong sense of belonging. And even uh, for some of our kids on the task force, they had also had some negative um, feelings around this. Um, but it's for that reason that I've decided not to renew the SRO contract. Um, making this decision at this point in time allows us to imagine how we can create schools that are emotionally, physically, and psychologically safe for all of our students that involve a different relationship with law enforcement. We continue, we will continue to engage our families, our students. Safety is our highest priority for our kids, as well as both security and psychological safety. And it's an important dialogue. And I know that as a community and as a school community in our community, we're ready to have it. So this doesn't mean that we will not have any formal relationships with law enforcement or contract with law enforcement moving forward. We won't have an SRO contract. 
because I do believe that a healthy and safe school system requires relationships with law enforcement, particularly to support child abuse investigations, threat assessment, emergency responses, and other key functions, as long as that relationship with the law enforcement is balanced with creating schools where all of our students feel safe and have a strong sense of belonging. I know you um, ask why now, why not sooner, why not later? Um, now it just is the point in time that in order to have a different conversation in our community, now is the time um, to non-renew those contracts. Um, as you know, we hadn't signed a contract yet, but we are approaching uh, for SROs, but we are approaching that this moment in time with hybrid. And so it felt like in order to have the real conversations in our community, a different conversation, uh, now was the time that um, this needed to be my uh, decision moving forward. So next you're gonna hear from our um, two facilitators, Matt Gonzalez and Richard Gray. Um, Matt and Richard are researchers and facilitators from NYU who specialize with working with communities like ours to engage in productive dialogue over tough issues to transform schools into places of wellness for all students. As you know, it's been our goal to have at least to start with one school to say, how can we be a trauma-informed school, a center of healing? And um, they have the experience um, across the country in doing just that. So they've been working with us and engaged in the, over the, in the community over the past eight weeks. And I'll let you um, take over from there. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the board, board chair, and all the representatives, I appreciate having the time to be able to speak with you. It is a little different time, it's 10 o'clock at night. And so if my voice gets a little lower, Barry White-like, that's because of the, the time, not me trying to put on my sexy voice. Um, I do wanna drop into the chat here um, by way of background. Some of you may have read our proposal, but this is a link to our, um, to our website that will give you some background about the Metro Center. Uh, which is a 43-year organization, uh, first directed by Dr. Lamar Miller, who was a disciple of Dr. Kenneth Clark, who believed in the importance of social science and research to support policy and research, particularly around issues of equity. Uh, it was then directed by Dr. Pedro Nagueta, who is now currently the Dean of the School of Education at USC, and our current director and also um, Vice Dean, he's been promoted to Vice Dean of the school on, I think it's inclusion and equity, um, is Dr. David Kirkland. Uh, Dr. David Kirkland was actually the one who wrote the proposal and brought me in uh, to help lead the effort. I will share my screen and I will try to do this very quickly so that we can get to um, questions as soon as possible. Sorry here. All right, that's a picture of my parents. That's not what we're supposed to say. I should say by way of background, um, my mother is a 35 year educator, uh, retired, was a elementary school teacher, also a teacher evaluator. She also did uh, social studies and reading curriculum, uh, both at the, I, I'm from South Jersey, um, the part of the state that actually is the garden state right outside of Philadelphia. I, and my father was a police officer. He was the first black police officer in my hometown. Um, along with my uncle, who was one of the first black state troopers. And so I felt like I was uniquely positioned uh, for this particular, um, this particular project. Um, I also want to say that I want to thank everybody, including the folks, Ethan, Craig, Christy, um, Dr. Richardson, um, Levy, Herrera, Lopez, um, and also Chief uh, John Teague, who were part of the planning team that helped on a regular basis to do this work. Um, we've been enormously hopeful that even though this is really a difficult um, and passionate issue, people have come to it with a sense of honesty and openness uh, that is both encouraging and I think supports the recommendations that we've put forward. Um, I want to start with our original plan of action and, and pull this directly from the summit information that was shared with us as a part of the RFP. Uh, we were initially asked to engage around a set of questions that, as you can see, focused around how to make students feel safe, how to create a, a community of belonging, um, shifts in the disciplinary system, which was a parallel process that was happening. And then there was the question of the appropriate relationship with law enforcement. Um, 
And our plan was to meet with district leaders, partner with community-based organizations and agencies, parents, students, and educators, and to facilitate a process that would move things forward. Um, one of the things that happened very quickly was on the very first call, there were two things that um, sort of put up red flags for us as a part of the process. I'm sorry, still on the home slide. This is not, has it not moved forward? Okay, then you're not seeing what I, it says it's been paused here for some reason. My screen sharing was being paused, so I'm gonna redo it. Let's see if it lets me do it this time. Can folks see, where do you see now? All right. For some reason it paused my, it said it was pausing. So I'll go back to the original here. And so these were the original words that were written in the summit. So to give an overview of the questions, the essential questions that the, they wanted the summit process to address. Uh, as we can see, the last one deals with the appropriate relationship between the district and law enforcement. And then these were the, um, the actions and activities that were listed in both the RFP and in our proposal. Uh, that had us meeting with, with folks partnering and also engaging in facilitation of a process that would move things forward and provide recommendations. Uh, very quickly, as we came into the process, we realized there were two things that created sort of red flags for us. First was in the very first meeting, during the discussion, we heard at least two or three people say, we've had a lot of conversation already. And I will tell you, as somebody who's facilitating a process when there's going to be conversation, that is an immediate red flag for you to say, to ask this question. And then we started to embed this question. What can we do different in this process that was different from the last process that you don't think produced an outcome? Right. That became the conversation that we were engaging with people. We also saw that there had been a rift amongst the stakeholders, particularly the students. I mean, when we read the task force report, the first thing, first portion of the task force describes a fracture between the student task force and the loose students from loose. And so there was a feeling that we wanted to know more about that to have an understanding of how to move forward, particularly because the proposal and outline for the summit talked about wanting to lift up uh, youth voice. And so we wanted to make sure that we understood what was causing that fracture. And then there was a widespread interest in the process that would yield a different outcome from the past. Uh, people were saying to us consistently, this, I'm hoping this is a conversation that produces something and giving us a sense that past conversations had not produced action in their minds. And again, if we're starting a process, we wanted to be very clear that we uh, weren't creating something that people thought was going to be the same thing. And so we developed a new course of action, right? We were going to develop our recommendations about next steps. Uh, we began an active engagement with the loose students and the students from the task force to do a restoration process. I've met with them a couple times to begin to talk about what it would take to bring back what was going to be the original youth voice together. And then to do a reframing of the process that people would trust and they would go beyond discussion to action. Again, these were the things that were emerging from our conversations. Let me just give you a very quick uh, overview of our work to date, as you can see here. And, and just so that you know, you'll have access to both this PowerPoint, but we're also going to be preparing a memo that will be finished next week, that will be a, an actual documentation of everything that we're talking here with a little bit more detail. So let me give you a very quick overview of our work to date. Uh, in addition to providing regular advisement and coaching meetings with Superintendent Perry and the team that I named before, again, they have been essential. We've also had uh, conversations with the planning team on a weekly basis. Uh, we've met with community members and leaders we really focus, as I mentioned before, on having met a couple of times and continuing to meet with the youth leaders uh, from Luce and the Student Task Force. Uh, we had a, a set of really positive conversations with school leaders, principals and vice principals, at the high school and middle school level. Uh, we've engaged the, the safety and risk management team, the Coalition for Equity, and finally a meeting with the law enforcement representatives from Kaiser Salem and Marion and counting. Sorry about that. You're on the bottom. Yeah. We also did some research, and again, we'll provide that in uh, an addendum. We have done a lit review uh, that looked at the data. Interestingly enough, uh, much of this data was already reported back to us from the people that we engaged with. I think in our first conversation with Chief T, he had mentioned the research that's in the first uh, bullet 
uh, about the there being no conclusive evidence about the positive impact of, of SROs. Uh, and that, again, what was consistent with what we heard from folks was the negative impact on students of color. But our emphasis also, and I think our emphasis moving forward will be around the alternatives to police and schools. And our conversations with school leaders actually led us into this road where people began to have conversations about when do I exactly need a police officer? And I should say there were times where people still felt like there are certain situations where I'm going to need an armed officer. But they also began to look at times when armed officers were engaged in saying some of those times, a good number of those times, we could actually engage somebody else. And how do we begin to explore the possibility of alternatives to police? So what did we learn from the process that's moving us forward? In every conversation that I had with everyone, and I can say this without, without question, at the end of it, people said, we felt like we need a decision on a direction. The decision doesn't have to tell us what we're going to do exactly, but at least gives us a frame to know that the engagement that we're going to have with the process is actually going to produce an outcome that's moving in a particular direction. I want to, I want to note here, they didn't say what decision that was. People indicated that they wanted a decision to go one way or the other, but people were very clear. They wanted a decision. They realized they weren't the ones making it, but the folks that were making it, they felt one needed to be made. And that those decisions would set the parameters and context for the engagement and give people a sense of possibility of trusting that this engagement will move in a particular direction. Something that they felt was important. I'm sorry? It's good. Okay. And so our first recommendation was, and as the uh, superintendent, is that the superintendent should make a decision about this uh, and make it public and then use that as a context for being able to move forward. And we can talk a little bit more about the how and whys of that. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague who will deal with the uh, other two recommendations, Matt Gonzalez. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. Um, really, really appreciate everyone's time. I'll, I'll go through these quickly, and none of this, I think, will sound radically different from what um, the original conversation was started as. But, you know, I think as Richard indicated and folks, I think, understand on the ground, um, after having a variety of conversations with folks from the Student Task Force and students from Loose, um, the organization, we, we, I think we understood that while there was a, a really valiant and necessary effort to centralize the conversation around the voices of young people uh, for a variety of reasons, some of those we don't know, some of those we've understood, um, the, the work of the young folks has become like ultimately politicized in a lot of ways that has like really undermined the, the voices of, of the youth. And, and, and it ultimately led to a variety of different functions of harm from young folks on, on both sides where ultimately you know young folks from from the different groups have have a really a, a variety of, uh, of moments where trust has been broken with the district with each other and uh, for us you know one of the central components of our work is ensuring that young folks are, are really central to the conversation and, and have an, an ultimate and meaningful say in the dialogue right and so I think what we understood is that while young folks were brought to the table, um, there, there were some parameters and some expectations and guidelines and, and, and ways that facilitating young folks, uh, which is a big piece of our work, um, did not necessarily get implemented. And it led to a lot of um, you know, fractures with the relationships with young folks. And it led to a kind of divisive space where young folks were kind of being kind of pitted against each other, right? And so for, for us, you know, I think it was really important to acknowledge that that was a, that was a function. Um, and, and after having conversations with the young folks, you know, from us, we come from a, a, a position of, you know, our work is, is very much about the, the cultures and climates of schools and, the, and actual, the actual transformational work that we really want to commit young folks and educators and parents and communities to be about. Um, and we, what we heard was that young folks were down to have that conversation. They really wanted to um, ultimately, you know, and it comes out, I think, in the task force report and some of the work that our young folks from Loose have done as well, is that the, the decision around school resource officers um, has actually, you know, become more of a political wedge that has undermined the ability to talk about the, the vision of what, you know, reimagine school safety, discipline, wellness, belonging means. And so from, from our perspective, the recommendation is that young folks need to be brought back into the conversation 
And because there's so much adult uh, voices and politics around this, if we can really reshape this dialogue to ensure that young people have undergone a process of restoration um, and, and rep repair for the various versions of harm and forms of harm that have been created, um, that in itself, one, um, represents actually the vision of what we actually want to suggest is the, the way to manage harm, right? In a community, in a school, it's not about punitive and, 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 and disconnection from people. It's actually about how do you repair and re, restore the trust that was broken? And I, and I believe, I think we believe that there is a, there's capacity and desire from both youth organizations and youth groups to do that work. Uh, that is not, you know, obviously this will require consent and commitment and expectations defined by all the young people before they get back in the conversation. But from, from our perspective, uh, the most effective process to move forward is in making sure that we've repaired the relationship with young people so that they can actually be central in the, 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 the upcoming conversations. And so that would actually, uh, Richard, you wanna go to the next slide so we can talk a little bit more about our, our third recommendation is, and again, like when we got into the conversation, you know, about eight weeks ago, our first question was like, why are we talking about school resource officers and, 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 and why is there a separate conversation about reimagining school discipline? From our perspective, um, Richard, you can go to the next, next slide. Those, those conversations cannot exist separate from each other. The idea that school safety and security and school discipline are, are, are disconnected from each other, I think misunderstands the, the various uh, ways that, that school discipline, school culture, school climate exist as an ecosystem in public spaces, right? And so I think what we, we wanted to understand is like the, the, the decision on this process on whether or not yes or no school resource officers, that is actually the, 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 the starting point for a deeper, more complex conversation about like, you know, I think what Richard was indicating and what some of our conversations with law enforcement and school leaders indicate is like, what are the actual right conditions that we require law enforcement? What are the conditions we do not require that? What are the other aspects of our communities that we need to draw into this? And so from our perspective, the, the, the conversation around school resource officers and school discipline needs to be connected and, and, and aligned. And again, contextualized as, as part of the ecosystem of schools and community and the way that we navigate these worlds, right? So that's one aspect that we really wanna ensure is, is, is key for like the next steps of this. We've offered up some framing that we've worked on with, um, you know, folks from, you know, the Salem Kaiser Police Department, the the NAACP, and our steering committee to think about what is a, a framing, as Richard indicated, that will invite people into a, a more complex and nuanced conversation uh, that can get us towards solutions. And so we offered up this idea of reimagining re school safety and really thinking about what does it take to build a culture of wellness, belonging, and security in the Salem Kaiser Public School District. And so that for us is, is our intent and a hope for, for a new reframe and a new invitation into a more complex conversation about what is the future and what does it actually feel like to enter a school where you feel like you have belong a sense of belonging a sense of wellness and a sense of security like what how do we create that and how do we ensure that young people and educators are at the driver's seat of that conversation and so you know in our hope we can really support the facilitation and restoration between our young people so that they can come to the table and really drive this next set of the phase of the conversation forward we obviously want to enlist our young people to really shape facilitate, plan, and it is in a, at their capacity, execute whatever public discussion is gonna look like. We also want that conversation to invite uh, primarily, again, like we really think from like, who are the most directly impacted by the thing we're talking about? Young people, educators, right? They're directly here. That does not suggest that law enforcement police, community members, a variety of other folks don't exist in that conversation, but we start from the center and build ourselves out. And so we really wanna invite young people and educators to really think about what does it mean to have a, uh, a, a sense of wellness, belonging, and security inside of our school buildings and our spaces. And so the, the kind of approach we're, we're interested in taking is really engaging young folks in the dialogue, engaging educators in the dialogue, and then thinking about what does that look like as a public conversation that invites in parents, um, invites in law enforcement, invites in variety of community members, and, and I think creates the space that we can all 
disagree about what this right role looks like, but ultimately we have to work towards a set of solutions and decisions that are at the best interest of our young people and that ultimately centralize their dialogue and conversation. And so those are the three recommendations. Uh, I'll pause there and welcome any conversation question you all may have. Are there questions from the board? I have several, so Director Lippold Pion. Uh, sure. I mean, first, I would just like to thank um, you know, Mr. Gray and Gonzalez for coming out here and taking the time to uh, work with our community on this process. I think that it sounds, you know, the way the way that it, you, you've presented it makes it sound like a lot more healthy of a conversation for our community to have. And I think uh, uh, an approach that makes us truly imagine uh, give give the argument of maybe not having SROs the light of day and imagine what could it look like. Um, you know, I'm all about making sure that it's a very factual uh, data-driven process and it sounds like that's what this is. So I would like to thank you for, for your work on this and uh, um, I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you. Any other board members? Okay, so I have a couple questions. Um, I appreciate you pointing out, Mr. Gray, the red flags that you state you felt when you first entered into the conversations with the district in the, what, whatever, you're the planning team is what you're calling it. Um, so I guess I, I'm curious, the first recommendation that you provided was a decision that needed to be determined based on SROs. Can you elaborate on that a little further? and how you came to that rec rec uh, recommendation and if there was more specific recommendation or if it was just a generalized, you need to make a decision one way or the other. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, um, that's a good question. And I, I wanted to clarify that it was about making a decision. And, it, and, and, and the thing about it is we, we heard that from people. I mean, part of the recommendation is we believe that a decision needed to be made but also we were carrying essentially the words from everybody that we talked to that felt like it's time for a decision to be made, right? That that is um, part of what might be holding things up in some level, right? And so we shared that information with the superintendent. Uh, I think for me, I will say that we, we came in as facilitators of a process right? and facilitators for me has always meant helping people move forward have a process move forward. Uh, and so part of what we saw as a sticking point to actually having the engagement produce an outcome that folks wanted was that decision. We could have come in and done all this engagement, had all these conversations, and there's a good chance you'd be right in the same position you were before with the same kind of information that you we wouldn't have heard anything new from people. And so our goal was to try to find a frame that would engage as many people Folks who believe that police, there's a role for police in school uh, as, um, I, I, I'm, I don't want to just call you Jesse because I, I want to pronounce your last name correctly, Jesse, um, had mentioned that if there's data that shows, and we and in some of our conversations, and I want to thank Ethan for creating these great conversations with, with school leaders, their thing was, I need in this situation to know what I do. I can call an officer. I'll need an officer in this situation but I may not need them this way. They may not need to be in the school. And so that there was a conversation that was really about how to, to target. And so we were trying to figure out a space that would allow for people with a range of perspectives to be able to come in and based on data and facts, actually argue a position. And so that's what it would be based on. Thank I don't know you. if that's a helpful answer. It is a helpful answer. I appreciate that. And my second question is throughout your slides, I noticed the significant lack of the word parent in the participation processes. And as a parent, um, I've made this statement before and I'm gonna make it again. It's great for high school age students to have a voice and participate because they're probably in a more mature zone. But there's a significant number of kids in our district that are not capable and need to have their advocate, which is their parent or guardian present. And I'm, I'm quite concerned, um, and I'm just gonna say it, that parents consistently do not have access to participate in these. There's usually community-based organizations that show up. There's a lot of access for students, which is excellent, but I just don't feel that parents have access. And I'm concerned that through your slides, that word was missing. And I, I do acknowledge 
that Mr. Gonzalez did state um, towards the end of his um, presentation that they would come in, but it, it just doesn't seem like there's an emphasis on parents. And so as a parent, I would like to state that I would like to see more emphasis on parents' participation in the conversations all throughout, not just singleized because we want to focus on a particular fractured entity of this conversation because parents are the ones that have to help kids long-term throughout life. Absolutely. And I think if you look at our work, um, you, would, you, would, you would not feel concerned about that at all. I mean, our work, in fact, people were sort of surprised that we came in from this work on the district side because we usually are on the parent side of this. And so I think your point is absolutely well taken. And I should name that the we don't see this what we did as the engagement process. This was the engagement process that got us to a framing. The engagement process has to be broader moving out. It has to be, it has to be inclusive of a range of people. As you mentioned, not only parents, I will go to family members because there are certain kids whose parents may not be their guardians, right? There are I, I, I believe in community residence because there are people who may not have kids in schools, but they have kids in schools. There they're, they're are folks who participate in it. So you are absolutely right. And uh, I'm saying this in a public record that any engagement process would have parents as a core part of it for the reasons that you named. Well, I appreciate that. And I will do more research on you because I saw the link in the chat. Well, um, I'm just going to add a little bit also. Thanks, Richard, for that. Um, very much aligned with what Richard says. What I will say is, and, and um, Richard's very much right, like a lot of our entry points tend to be with, uh, with community-based organizations, with parent leaders, parent advocates. What I will say is um, part of the framework that we've worked from, though, is very explicitly about ensuring that those who are most directly connected to the issue are the ones who are at the central piece of the conversation. And so what I will also say is high school uh, young folks have a, a huge capacity to talk about policy, curriculum and teaching, but I'm actually gonna push everyone to acknowledge that actually middle school and elementary school and even kindergarten young people have the capacity, if given the space to engage in these conversations, they're not gonna necessarily show up to a board, a board meeting, but I, but I wanna argue that um, yes, 100% parents need to be you know, part of that dialogue, guardians need to be part of that dialogue, but, but very much in every aspect of the, the, the teaching aspect and curriculum space, young people can be very much engaged in it. I think it requires a little bit different type of facilitation. And so, you know, what I, what I can suggest is that we will more, more than, um, more than, um, more than we can acknowledge really attempt to ensure that, um, again, those who are directly impacted by the conversation are central, but that doesn't mean that um, anyone's voice is not uh, critical, important, and necessary in the broader conversation. So thank you for naming that, and, and, and we'll, we'll make sure to make sure that that's explicit in our work as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Director Hyen. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate the important role of parents. They really are central. Uh, no, they're not there in the school every day, but I heard from so many parents where my child was being bullied and it was an officer in the school that actually saved their life. I mean, they didn't commit suicide or whatever because that officer was there. And these kids that are bullied are not going to participate in something where they're going to feel like the other side is going to come after them. They're going to be silent. And their only voice is their parent. Thank you, Thank you for naming that. Um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, the, the work that we've done, not just in New York City, but across the country, particularly with young people of multiracial backgrounds, from those who are in the most privileged spaces to those who are in the most marginalized spaces, is always about making sure that the space that, that, that is created for young people to talk about policy, to talk about teaching practices, to talk about what the, the you know the most vulnerable aspects of their lives, um, you know, again, that's for us is very core to the facilitation process. And so, uh, you know, our commitments are always about ensuring that every young person who enters a space that we occupy, virtual or physical, um, feels like they their voice is valuable. Um, that that we're speaking from a place of fact and reality, and and also again ensuring that um, all voices, but but again, particularly ensuring that those who are directly impacted and marginalized by systemic racism 
are the ones who have a have a have a uh, the first say in this. Again, this is not to suggest that that uh, all voices are not relevant, necessary, and part of the conversation. Um, but I can assure that uh, all the facilitation that we do is is very much like grounded in inclusion, inclusive practices, uh, and, and and again centered and facilitated particularly by young people. And so my, I'm I'm a I'm a semi older uh, older of an individual in this world. Um, and so those who were, you know, part of our team is young people who are facilitators um, and, and, and will be, you know, centrally kind of facilitating the conversation. And the reason for that is not performative. It's actually because they hold me accountable. They hold our work accountable to ensure that it is inclusive and accessible and affirming for young people. And so thank you for naming that there is harm that happens on all sides of this conversation. And our commitment is about making space that welcomes in that, that dialogue in a, in a way that is about transforming pain, concern, frustration into productive conversation. And, and you can, you know, we can share the, the, the wealth of impact our work has had on really shaping and, and building capacity with and for young people to, to, to ultimately take ownership so that they actually, they are become their own advocates. And that's really our work. Thank you. I, 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 I would just, I, can I just affirm, but again, the parent part is, is something that you don't need to convince us of. I mean, I'm, it, it really is. I, I really would say that part of this is shaped by the kind of engagement we were having for this process. But um, I can assure you that, that the voice of parents will be a part of it. Uh, we produced a film called Parent Power. We believe in the, in the voice of parents. I will say that your, your issue of bullying if we want to be able to get to those issues and figure out what is the what is the response that needs to happen to make those kids feel safe and welcome, right? And we believe that the shaping of the conversation that we've talked about doesn't take you away. It actually says, in addition to police, are there other things we could be doing that could get to that? Because my 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 personal feeling is if we've gotten to a police officer dealing with bullying, we've missed a few steps along the way that should have happened before we got there. And so this is a way to be able to more fully have that conversation. So I, I, I think the issue that you raise is a critical one and, and should be a central part of our conversation moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Director Goss. Yeah, and I do have some things to say. And one just caught me one second ago and it bothered me and it came, I believe from Mr. Gray to quote exactly, um, that he appreciated the voice of parents and we will be a part of that. Will be doesn't please me. If you were in this district to assess what was going on with parents, family, kids, I would assume you already would have talked or spoke with parents. And I didn't hear that. I heard, well, it will be. So this is not the first round we've had of this, these sort of discussions. And we have looked into it and we have talked to police ourselves and we have talked to all types of parents and children. And I guess I'll speak bluntly. I'm not overly impressed about having a couple guys come in from NYU to solve little Salem, Oregon's problems. And I didn't hear where you had really assessed the whole district. I heard over and over again, loose. And I understand that organization and I understand that that was important to you. And I understand that you went to what you thought was the center. Well, I wonder about all the other people out there that were never contacted, that were never talked to. And it didn't sound to me like you had extended past what you considered those more most impacted, being uh, loose or pipeline to prison or any of those other groups. And um, I want to know what the ordinary parent has to look forward to in this. So I'll say two things to that. Um, I'm not from New York, I'm from New Jersey. Um, and so I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, and I do know that 
um, I was surprised that you picked people uh, from NYU in New York to be a part of the process. We, me too. We were invited. Well, I'm, well, and that's a that's a good question. Um, I don't have an answer to why you picked me, but you did, <laughs> and so I can't change that. I will say this: um, I'm not sure if there's a belief that somehow our New York perspective is impacting this. We work all over the country. Um, we work with a range of people. Um, and so if there is a sense that we have a New York bias, I'm, I'm, I'm welcome to hear it and, and try to address it. I think it's probably more of a university bias. We're researchers and that's what, so I would imagine researchers within Portland might even do the same thing. Um, I, I understand this idea that we wanted a broader engagement. I will say this and I'll speak bluntly. The thing that caught me was there was a desire for a broad engagement and then there was a timeline of wanting it all done with a report by the middle of March. And I kept asking myself, if you really want a broad engagement of that many people, you would give yourself more time. And what we found is that this process was being linked to a timing of a decision that needed to be made about the SROs. And so I will tell you that if we did not have a decision about the SROs, there was no way in hell we would have been able to engage a broad range of people in time to be able to do all this and have a report by mid-March. And so part of our recommendation that was connected to this was to say, you might want to decouple this decision from a process that would allow for a broader engagement. And so while it may not seem as clear to you, and I understand that because we're just presenting it now, we think by decoupling it and giving yourself more time, it gives the opportunity for more parents and more people to be involved in the process than fewer. Now, we can disagree on that, but that's at least our thinking behind that, 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 I, that is more about our analysis of it than maybe where we're from. The Thank other you. comment that bothered me a great deal, and I think that was made by Mr. Gonzalez when he, he said something, of course, we, we sided with the district. What did that mean? Or was it, perhaps it was Mr. Gray, one of you said that, and I should have written next to my note which one of you it was, but what does that mean, you sided with the district? I don't, I'm not sure I understand where the question. Yeah, yeah if you wanna give me a little more context of the, the comment, or at least which of the slides maybe we were referring to, happy to clarify yeah. um, any confusion there is. I see all the hands coming up and I saw them in order. So I'm gonna to try to go through them just to our board. So um, Director Goss, if it happens to come back into your mind, the more specific um, section of their comments, we can wrap back around to you. Um, Director Chandra Geary had his hand up next. Yeah, there's a small procedural comment uh, based on what Mr. Gray, you just mentioned. Uh, if I just I want to make sure I heard you right, you said a decision was made about SRO and you are not given enough time to engage a wide because we have 90 different communities in this town. 90 different. Some have come from all parts of the world. Some have escaped countries where entire institutions broke down. I'm an immigrant. So the way in immigrant families it works is you really have to start at one level with the parent level and then work to child. If you start with child, it'll lead to intergeneration problems. So if I heard you right, you said a decision had to be made on SRO as the end point, and then you were given time till March, and then you had to rush through and make a decision. But as a board, we have, uh, let me understand right, as a board, we have a statutory obligation to ensure the safety of our student. And we have delegated it to our superintendent through what we call an executive limitation. So in other words, we outsource our responsibility to superintendent and superintendent should make it happen, whether we're using SRO or law enforcement or addition, whatever it takes, as long as it is within the law, within the statutory limitation, that operational part is not for us, but it is the district's operation. I really want our community and all of us to understand that we are a legal required body to ensure the safety of all the children. So we have delegated that responsibility in our case. Now, if that is the case, 
the end point we are looking for is safety. But if we start with the premise that the end point has to be SRO has to go, that doesn't talk about safety of the children. It talks about a process, not the outcome. And you're right. You have not been given enough time to meet the white families and listen to them saying their children could be sexually uh, trafficked during the digital days. You have really not got enough time to listen to South Asian community and say how they feel scared because a Sikh child is wearing turban and he could be bullied and picked in the school. And he's pretty frightened that a Sikh gentleman was murdered after 9-11 in Phoenix, Arizona. So you're right. You need to have a thorough process of making sure all the community is factored in because none of us want any other outcome other than safety of our children. None of us want our children getting into law enforcement or a judicial legal system. None of us want our children to get scared because they're bullied or picked or they get scared with the law enforcement. So that's the outcome as a board we can expect. Of course, we have delegated it through what we call executive limitation. And one of the things I want the community to completely understand, including Mr. Gray and Mr. Gonzalez and all of us, is that for a long time, we had not looked at our own data what we call civil rights data collection, our ex very high expulsion, very high suspension, whether our kids are truly getting arrested in school or not, as opposed to they're getting arrested in the community. We don't know if it is they're getting community to juvenile justice system or school to juvenile justice system. I had asked this question when the four of us met in a Zoom call. Of course, at that time, your time was limited. Because we really want a process where all the 90 communities feel their children are going to be safe at the end of the day. Sure. SRO is not the main issue. You're right. SRO was an end point given to you. But for me, the end point is my child comes back alive. Or my child doesn't get sexually trafficked. Or my child doesn't die of suicide. Or a gang violence. Or, you know, sexually abused. Those are some of our biggest problems we are dealing with for which law enforcement, SRO, and everybody is doing. Now, at no point in time, we have been given the historic data of publicly reported civil rights data so that we as a board or we as a community can understand what exactly is the problem we are trying to solve here. We have a very high expulsion suspension rate in our district, without a doubt. I have personally seen the data. But we, the same publicly domain data also shows a different picture about our SRO. We have had other information that was given to us, which doesn't connect well. So the question I'm asking you is, have you concluded your findings based on thing, or are you making this hypothesis? It's almost like an a priori, hypothesis or decision before looking at the data to tell us a story? And if so, what would your recommendation be? What kind of data set we should be looking in the last five years and perhaps in the next, on a monthly basis, monitor when we are making these changes? Because we are having kids come back to school after almost a year of not being in school. This is the highest risk time for us. So what would your recommendation be what kind of data we should go back and look in the last five years and moving forward as we make these changes on a monthly basis. And we as a board will definitely make it a point to monitor that to ensure our children are safe. Nobody enters juvenile justice system and nobody gets scared. Would you have any suggestions on those questions? Uh, I'm going to try to figure out because it, it was uh, just to make sure that I'm answering the right question. And I, and I first I want to say, uh, Ms. Mrs. Goss, Ms. Goss, uh, I think if you're referencing how we entered into the district, we were hired by the district. And I've said, normally we are working with community-based organizations. And so I was just clarifying our entry into the district was to be hired by the district. Um, I hope that clarifies it and, and makes that less problematic. Uh, it was just who, who we were actually hired to engage with. And that's why I've been working closely with the superintendent on that. 
I will say this. I, I want to reiterate something because there's, there, I'm getting a sense that people feel like, number one, that we made a decision. We did not. Right? I want to say that again. We did not make a decision. If you, if, and let me put it this way. If we were going to make a decision, you would know that we were making a decision, right? We would tell you this is the decision we think you should make, right? What we were saying very clearly is people were telling us somebody needs to make a decision so that we know when we're engaging in this process, it's moving in a direction. The superintendent could have made a decision in a different direction and she was basing it on information she already had, right? So that's, I wanna make that clear. The second thing that I wanna also reiterate is we believe the process that everybody's saying they wanna participate in is the one we're creating now. Everything that people are saying they want folks to be able to have some say in the parents, the officers, they have the opportunity and this engagement to say, we need officers for these particular things. And if the data supports it, they will win the day on that particular thing. I, I wish I could have had you all as a part of the conversations that Ethan had developed with school leaders because they had the same challenges. They feel as strongly as you board chair that we want our kids to be safe, right? They're also balancing that with we also know that there's ways that we can do this where we don't need to have an officer here, right? And we're ready to explore those cases. And if we land in a place that says we need an officer in this situation, then we're going to get an officer in that situation. But if we land in a place that says we could have somebody else who could speak to this particular issue who's not an officer, then they feel like they're responding to the kids of color who feel like, can you do something that is more tailored and surgical. So for me, the range of perspectives are still possible in this engagement. But what people have as a faith in it is that there will be an outcome and it will be forced, it will be focused not on, do I agree or disagree, but what do we actually do? What do we implement? What do we need to be supporting? What training do we need in place? What additional resources might we need for particular things? And so we were trying to shape a conversation that would get us there, but not exclude people from it. Now, if we haven't named it, we might not have said it as clearly as we should have, but I want to restate it so that the people sort of know that this is not to stop conversation or to cease it. It is to create a process that actually focuses it and, and tailors it towards producing a solution that balances the security with the safety and well-being. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Uh, so Director Lippold-Pion and then Director Glassy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, well, I see you, Paul, but I didn't see, I saw Jesse first. And we'll try to keep our answers short so that we. Sure. Um, I mean, first, I mean, I'd like to say, let's just, you know, recognize a couple of facts, right? One is that um, our student safety uh, process here in St. Louis Kaiser has actually looked very highly across um, the nation from with many other districts or across the nation, you know, kind of modeling after us. Uh, which goes to show the importance of this work, right? I mean, we're not just, these conversations aren't happening in a lot of places from my conversations with boards around our state and from other parts of the country. Um, so this is, we're kind of paving a path forward, at least in our community uh, and a lot of districts across the country. A lot of people aren't talking about this, uh, right? So that's fact number one. Fact number two is, um, you know, our community is very divided and very hurt right now. You know, I think that's, you could say that about the country as well, but in our community, you know, we've seen that. You know, you can tell just by board member comments, uh, you know, uh, in response to this, that there's a lot of hurt, you know, and there's a lot of pain. Um, you know, Marty shouldn't have to be in tears to, you know, to bring up the fact that, uh, you know, her kids should be able to speak, you know, and be heard. Uh, we're seeing this across co college campuses, including Willamette. We had a student survey, you know, that said that students are afraid to speak. Uh, and, and so I think that, you know, that pain is there. And so with that is going to need to come. Uh, an approach from you, uh, you know, Mr. Gray, Mr. Gonzalez, to realize that um, a lot of people are free to speak. A lot of people are acting out of pain and emotion. And I know it sucks and it's hard, uh, but I would, you know, advise you to keep that in mind as we're approaching parents. And I, I agree with Director Bethel that parents need to be involved. Um, you know, and the third is just because this is the way that we've always done things doesn't mean it's the way we need to do it moving forward. You know, just because our system that we have right now uh, is recognized by a lot of other places doesn't mean that um, that it's the best way. You know, uh, we're always improving the society. We're always improving. So we need to truly have an intellectual conversation about what things could look like or how it need, how things could be. So that way we can be better and better serve kids. 
Uh, and then lastly, I would actually like to <laughs> request, uh, uh, if you're willing to, uh, advisor Mabinton, who I believe is probably the most important voice to hear on this because she was uh, not only as our student advisor with a lot of insights to how students feel, but also was a huge, played a huge role in the student uh, advising committee on the, the current decision and how things are right now. And so uh, advisor Mabinton, if you're willing to speak, I mean, of course, uh, Director Bethel, you guide the, the order, uh, but I would love to hear you, uh, you know, after other people speak, hear your insights on this if you're willing to. Thank you, Director Lippold-Pion. I'd really like for Director Blassi and Director Kylo to ask their questions specifically to this presentation first. So Director Blassi. Thank you. And I too definitely wanna hear from Lynette, but um, you know, this is something we've been wrestling with for, for a very long time and you know, across the country obviously. But you know, um, first I, I wanna thank the two of you for the work that you've done and for sharing uh, what you looked at and what your recommendations for the next steps are. Um, but I really appreciate that you were, you know, you, you know, obviously you, you've hit a nerve with the board and you'll find that, you know, to be the, the same with the community. But I appreciate that you circled back to clarify your role as compared to the superintendent's decision. Um, but I also appreciate that you pointed out and you learned very quickly that this work really can't proceed until some type of decision around the SRO. Um, and, and it'll still come up. Uh, there will still be lots and lots of conversations. Yeah. There will be lots of concerns uh, from, from all sides. But a couple of things I wanna go back to that you, you pointed out and, and not necessarily in the form of questions, but I think they're important. Um, you know, I really appreciate that you acknowledge the damage that was done during the process to our students. And these are our students who brought this issue to us years ago. Um, and these are students who, you know, spent months and months, um, including Lynette, uh, examining this issue and spending their own time to listen to all voices um, and I appreciate that you acknowledge that there was damage done to those relationships between those students. And one of your recommendations is before we proceed, we need to help them yeah. restore those relationships. Otherwise, uh, you know, this is going to continue to be a struggle going forward. So, so I appreciate that you, you saw that right away and that you have a plan for that. Um, but I think one of the things that you pointed out that is key to this is what do we actually need uh, in our schools? What do we need police officers to do and not do? And you know, having um, observed uh, the, the process that Lynette and others went through and hearing some of the conversations, um, I think it was pretty clear that over the years, um, we unfortunately or have, have kind of defaulted to relying on SROs for discipline. And, and so I do appreciate that the superintendent in the district want to step back and look at discipline and school safety. Um, because I, I think your, your question is spot on. What should police be doing in schools and what shouldn't they be doing? And if they're not going to be doing the things that we've come to rely on them to do, that are, it's probably what's causing that harm to our uh, marginalized students. Um, you know, th if that's where the harm is coming from, you know, what do we need to stop doing, and what do we need to put in place so that uh, you know whatever it is that's happening at home or in the classroom that's manifesting in whatever it is, how do we help address that? Whether it's, uh, you know, depression or all the things that I'm sure you're hearing that we're very, very concerned about, but um, what does that look like going forward? So I appreciate that you highlighted uh, the, those questions. Um, and then I think you probably figured out <laughs> just by listening to this conversation, you know, the other thing that you pointed out uh, it's very clear that, and I think you actually used the word politics, but uh, you know, all, all of that, whatever that word is, 
um, has definitely played into a lot of this across the community. And it's become an issue of, you know, a singular issue and you're, you're on one side or you're on the other side. And so I so much appreciate that you're helping get us beyond the, the singular issue. Um, and, and it's, you know, that singular issue is still gonna be debated. Um, I'm sure the superintendent will hear, <laughs> she will hear about it. Uh, I'm sure she probably already is. Uh, but I, you know, I, I admire the work that you're doing. I admire the superintendent for making a decision. Um, and, you know, uh, but just know you've got a board that will be very in tune with how we proceed. And you've heard some of the concerns about including parent voices and, um, you know, uh, you know, all students. So, so I guess all that to say, uh, thank you. And, <laughs> Best wishes as you continue this work. <laughs> okay, Director Kylo, and my, then we'll finish my, with Director Chandra Geary because we really do need to get through the night. Yes, mine is very short. Um, thank you for your recommendations. They all make perfect sense to me. They all seem very reasonable. I don't have any problems with them. The only issue I have is why was the decision not made until tonight? We asked for the decision last summer and the decision wasn't made until tonight. And that troubles me a great deal. And I know you can't answer that and maybe the superintendent will at some point, but it, that's my question. Yeah, I think I started out with an acknowledgement that it's taken too long. Um, and sometimes um, the hardest of things um, take longer um, to untangle and um, yeah, if I could go back and be reflective and, well, you're, you're shaking your head at me, so I'm gonna stop. Director Chandra Geary. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gray, Mr. Gonzalez. And you know, this has been a very tough and painful process, but at the end of the day, this is the decision of Superintendent Perry. It is an operational decision. We have delegated it to her. We are gonna expect safety how Superintendent Perry is going to make it happen is the operational part of it, right? So it's really important. And we are going to make this change. So while the superintendent is implementing important changes in the districts, which she just announced, including canceling the contract with SRO and redefining the relationship of our schools with law enforcement agency, we still have an oversight responsibility to ensure our students are safe. I want everybody in the community to understand we are responsible. We have a fiduciary responsibility towards children's safety. It's required by the statute. Today, I would like to go on the record and ask my board to join me. And let's, and I've shared this with Superintendent Perry. She's aware of it as a board that we ask the district for the following step in order for us to make sure that we monitor this executive limitation, which has been delegated to Superintendent Perry. In the past, we didn't have sufficient monitoring and accountability around this function. That the district will present at least five years disaggregated data on school arrests, law enforcement referrals, expulsion, suspension, abuse reporting of sex abuse and other required civil rights data collection reports. These are all, anyway, they're collecting it and reporting it for public domain. This will allow us to study if there is a trend and what kind of trend and different communities are impacted. The district will present disaggregated data on school connectedness, which Mr. Gonzalez spoke so high, beautifully. We do use a few data sets, which we started doing it in the last few years, or similar measures so that children feel safe and belonging in school. And on a monthly basis, continue to report these data on school arrests, law enforcement, referrals, expulsions, suspensions, abuse reporting, and other requirements so that we can fulfill our responsibility towards student safety as we make this change. Because just because we have envisioned a change doesn't mean we have implemented it. I want our community to hear that. We still have to work through the glitches we have to implement it. We have to train the people, get them up to speed. Restorative justice is a good intention, 
But to reach that outcome, a lot of work needs to be done. I, so while we're doing that, it's like changing oil while you're driving your car. We still have to make sure our kids are safe at the end of the day. So we would like this to be the monitoring standards. I would like Vice Chair Bethel to see if there is at least a support from the board to say that we could give clear instructions to Superintendent Perry and the district. So they're starting immediately on the next board meeting onwards, we can hear this data as we are working through these designs. Superintendent, uh, uh, Vice Chair Bethel. Sean, just a minute, direct Mr. Yeah. Dekopoulos. Um, I, I think it, um, it would be helpful to clarify uh, a couple of things. I heard a request for data, um, which to me is different than adding a new monitoring system. If the board, I mean, the board can request data. Um, I think your 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 um, your practice is if. Uh, but is it if if three board members or if it's just board leadership want want to ask for data of the district, you you've always been able to do that. But if this is uh, actually changing monitoring data in an executive limitation, you'd have to take that up as an action item in two board meetings. And so, right. and, and we would need to um, rather just hearing hearing us this spoken we'd need to actually craft language like you have when you have amended your your els so if it's a data request that's one thing you can easily do that tonight if it's if it's actually changing monitoring data on an el on student safety there have to be board action in the future mr dacopoulos thanks for clarifying it we will ask for the data and hopefully we'll have a data dashboard more in a real time with historical thing. And then I would like the support of the board so that we can start making the first reading and second reading and make it into an action item so that this is a very important equity indicator in the mind of everybody in the community. Why not we put systems in place so that while we are making the transformation, which is an operational decision, we have implementation uh, and accountability put in place so that we can make mid-course corrections if necessary. That's what I heard from Mr. Gray and others that its course needs to change. They are looking for data and we don't have readily available data to provide. So, so to, yes. move for, to move forward in that capacity then, what the board would do is you would introduce um, a uh, an amendment to this the EL on relating to student safety so that we had underlined words that that were going to be added or striked out words that were going to be taken away and that the board would have a, a first reading of that just like we do all uh, policy changes. So um, that's what the next step would be. Thank you, right, Mr. Thank you. Director Shonagiri, can you please pause? Director Blassi, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, I was just hoping that we we could hear from Lynette. I, I think that, you know, Satya, you you always raise a good point, but I I, I would just really like to hear from Lynette. <laughs> I have a couple of suggestions for Chair Shangiri in a minute. Lynette, would you please go ahead? And Dr. Shangiri, your hand's still up. Could you take it down? Um I just wanted to say that um, I think the decision um, being made now, um, I don't think there's ever a wrong time to make a decision, especially because I really do feel like we needed that process with other students and the task force. I think us coming together was such a strong process in this. And um, I think it was important for also for people to hear our recommendation as students. Um, another thing is I love how Mr. Gonzalez brought up. Lynette, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Lynette, can you guys hear me? <laughs> it's my data, okay. Lynette can, you, Lynette, can you please turn off your video and then restate everything up to Mr. Gonz uh, past Mr. Gonzalez because we couldn't hear you. 
Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, with Mr. Gonzalez saying that uh, students, to mend that relationship first, I think that was also a 100% good point that he made. Um, students coming together and being a part of this process is amazing. So the fact that we are willing to have that conversation with each other and move forward is something that's a part, part of this process. Another thing is student safety. Um, I'm looking forward to see how that role will be played in the schools now. Um, that is something that we don't have an answer to yet, but I know that you guys will figure out. Just like Etan said, meeting with principals and we have m missed a few steps. Um, like officers shouldn't be dealing with bullying. They shouldn't be dealing with things that aren't a part of safety. And our student recommendation was important because it did state that there was a flaw in the SRO system and that it needed to be fixed and that they needed a better relationship with students. But also from my understanding, this decision was made because there isn't enough, if, if I'm correct, something to do with the contract, um, funding, enough officers to push out there. So if we can't fix the SRO system, then I do believe it was a good decision to just throw away the contract because, you know, like we said, we need students of color to feel safe and belonging to, and, you know, not just privileged students. And if it's, if students feel unsafe, then I do feel like whatever's making them unsafe does need to be removed if it can't be fixed. Um, I do understand the board, like I said, with their concerns with safety. I want to know how that plays out. And I do understand that this recommendation did not come from, from NYU, but this was the superintendent's decision. Um, I do believe she wants what's best for the, the students in the school district. So I trust her 100%. And also the other students on the task force, when we also met about this, uh, I think it was a day ago, we all agreed that if it's what's best for our, the future generation of kids, and this is what's next to take the few steps to improve this system, then I think I'm 100% for it. And so is students. And I do understand where everyone's coming from with the parents. Lynette, we lost you. Your audio is well. Just one second, Director Hyan, see if she comes back. Parents, we need to make sure oh, that- Lynette, we lost you for about 10 seconds, audio entirely. Can you hear me now? Is it good yes. now? Uh -huh. I'm so sorry, you guys. But um, <laughs> I think parents with their emotions and how they like to argue and they can't admit when they're wrong and it's okay to be wrong, um, I think that can- come into a big part of this too. So I just think whatever decisions we make moving forward, we always need to keep students in mind 100%. And uh, I respect you, Superintendent Perry, for making this decision because this was a process and it's hard. Um, running a district is hard and we mess up, we make mistakes. And I think the thing we need to focus on right now is moving forward and taking the next steps. Like NYU said, we need to uh, make up a safety plan. We need to move forward because safety will be missing in schools for now, but we need to get on that as soon as possible because we are returning back to school and that is the number one thing and priority. But everything else sounds good. Um, I like where this is headed. Thank you, Lynette. Director Hyan, and then we really need to move on. Right. Just real quick question. I'm kind of confused because uh, the superintendent said she canceled the contracts, but I thought they had expired on their own over the summer or something. And I'm just kind of confused about that. Have we had a contract all along and I just didn't realize it or did they actually expire on their own sometime previously? Yeah, we haven't had a contract, um, Director Hines since uh, July 1. And that was a um, variety of reasons, pause contract, all of that. Um, this decision was not to renew them going into hybrid and into next year. Okay, thank you. If I said it incorrectly, I didn't mean to. I thought I had that part nailed. Yeah, you made it sound like you just canceled them and that that's not. So okay, not thank yet. you. So for two, just two um, follow-up items. One, I heard Dr. Shandagiri request specific data from the superintendent, which she's also received by email. They've had an exchange on that and I think there needs to be further clarification. Does the board want 
future data outlined from Dr. Shantagiri just a bit ago, presented to us in the boardroom in the near future. Show me a thumbs up. Great. Superintendent Perry, you saw the thumbs up as a majority. So please work with Dr. Shantagiri on the specific points that he sent to you by email. And, yeah, and I just um, want to clarify, sorry to interrupt, um, some of the specific points, I think my clarification was, we actually don't collect the data. My actual recommendation is um, that you really come together as a board to say what exact data do you want, like the discipline data we get, you know, there's a variety of things we get, but unless you know exactly what you want, if you want us to create data sources for you, then we'll create data sources um, and start tracking data, but that requires additional personnel. So it's great, we'll do that. We'll hire another data out and out analyst for you, but I, but I need you to know which we can get and which we haven't. And um, Dr. Well, Shiner, I have a, I have a suggestion for that. About yeah. that. So I would so, love a, a couple board members. Yeah, so I actually would like to recommend that we follow up with Dr. Or excuse me, Mr. Gray and Mr. Gonzalez in board member meetings. I would typically like to talk to them and engage them in this process because I have a lot more questions. So if other board members would like to have conversations with them, we can set them up in groups of three and have those conversations. There's a fair amount of information that board members are missing through this process, which is evident from tonight's conversation. And we as board members, um, I believe deserve to be informed on that process. And I'd like to hear from both of you directly for that. And then at the same time, we can also have conversations about data and, and what the board is after with the superintendent. So we can come forward and make a modification to our EL specifically around safety in our schools. Um, in the near future. So is is that supported by the board? If so, show me a thumbs up. I'm trying to count really quick. Danielle, before we vote on that, I think it's really important that we be absolutely clear on what data we want. I, I mean, right now, you can't say, let's collect data. We need to know what will be necessary for a decision and how we want it collected and how often the the reports come back and we've got a pretty darn good superintendent along that line. And I think she needs to get together with um, Director Chandra Gary and figure out what is able to collect, what we'll use and what we need. I think it'll be sure. helpful in our meetings with other board members in those small groups to have this conversation. And I agree that Dr. Chandra Gary can provide the starting point for us and then we can add into it. Dr. Shandagiri, is it possible that we move forward into the rest of the meeting or is there a final point that you can make right now? I will be happy to take the recommendation that came out, work with Superintendent Perry, and we'll come up with a little bit outlined draft and then others can weigh in rather than everybody trying to jump in. Would that be okay? Superintendent Perry and I can work and then share a draft with all of you. So can I just... Just well, before you do, Mr. Gray, Director or Advisor Mabinton, is your hand still up because you have something to say? Because I don't want to cut you off before we let Mr. Gray and Mr. Gonzalez wrap up. <laughs> okay. One was just a point of clarity. I don't feel, I feel like I didn't answer the question that you had. So if you could restate it and maybe add it as a part of the questions that follow up, there was a data question that you asked me about and I didn't want to I didn't want to be dismissive of it, but I, I, I wasn't clear on it, so I, I just wanted to, to name that. Second thing is I, I, want to, I want to emphasize the fact that the decision about not having police in schools doesn't mean that the schools immediately become unsafe. And I, and I think part of it is because there will be a relationship with law enforcement. So I wanted to clarify the difference between ending the SRO contract and having a relationship with law enforcement. There will be times when law enforcement needs to be engaged in schools. And that is a part of the conversation. The question is how it looks like, right? So I just wanted to sort of emphasize that point of it. And I'm gonna ask just as we're gonna be engaged around this, there've been a lot of suggestions on people we should be talking to. And so I'm gonna actually ask the board to not just say what data points did, ask us what data points. I think you should be suggesting data points. You should be suggesting people you want us to engage, right? And so um, I appreciate, I know that we're the guys from New York this is a transaction. I'd like for it to be a relationship so that over time, 
you will get to know us and we'll get to know you. And through that process, we'll have a better understanding of each other. So I want to welcome you all to be able to, Lynette, you're going to get a call already. I mean, that's, that's already going to happen, but it is a, uh, but I, I want to invite the board to, to, to share that with us because there's no way that we are going to be able to get to a community, particularly being on Zoom without the people who know the community and being in it, being able to tell us how to engage it. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez, did you want to say anything in final? Yeah, just want to thank, uh, thank Lynette for, from my perspective, speaking so much clarity and, 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 and brilliance tonight. And this is not, you know, infantilizing, but like really do want to honor that, like, that it, actually I noticed that it was hard for you to get in. And so thank you for being persistent and, and speaking your reality. Um, I want to thank everyone for asking us uh, all the questions you have and invite and welcome any more conversation and questions like my colleague said. Thanks for the time. Um, I, I'm really appreciative. Um, I didn't expect to stay up this late tonight, but I'm actually really happy that we got to be here in dialogue with you all. And hopefully we were able to respond to uh, any of your questions, concerns, et cetera. And, and, and again, welcome more dialogue with you all and others that you think we should be engaged with. Thank you. Thank you for being here so late. I love New York, even though you live in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Super from, New from New Jersey. I'm okay, okay. from New York, so I'm in New York. <laughs> I just wanted to make uh, one reference comment here, but Matt and Richard, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, to the board, I will do whatever you want as a board for data. I really will. I'm not blocking that in any way. I just so just know that I want what you want data, transparency, better outcomes for kids, safe and welcoming schools, inclusive um, communities. Um, and the, the focus on restoration, and I think the, the reason NYU was the winning uh, proposer on this, the, the focus on restoration, that is exactly what you want, we want to have happen in schools, restorative practice. And so to have a process that was fractured and to not restore it would, would have been, which takes longer to restore, but it wouldn't be modeling from my position how we want every single person to show up in our schools and what I know you want as a board. Restorative processes with our kids, a different discipline system. So I just wanna make that point that, well, that's messy and takes longer. I believe in it so much that if I didn't insist that we had restorative processes with kids, um, I shouldn't be the superintendent. So just know that um, to the board, I know you have taken heat along this as well. And I know it has created um, frustration and pain for you. And that was never my intent. I just wanna try to make right decisions for kids. And I know that together we will be, um, we will be better. So thank you for your leadership. And I, would just love to ask, if, I know that we have this one more report and I'm sure that Mr. Wolf would be probably quick about it, but I would really love to use the restroom. So can we take like a quick five minute break and be back here at five, or excuse me, 828, 828. Okay, be fast. Thank you. <laughs> take care everybody. Night y'all. Thank That's you, have a great night. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys.